is equal to 0. Because this is the delta, delta is just 1 or 0 to so 0. Okay? So this is a very useful trick to remember. Whenever you're differentiating at the inverse of a metric, where one of its indices are contracted with, with the metric, you can transfer the derivative of the metric okay, at the price of a minus. Okay? Now, the next thing we remember is that uh, this quantity here can be written in terms of gamma, of the gamma. It should be covariantly constant. Okay? So, the co covariant constancy of the metric is, is the assertion that uh, del mu of GAA is equal to um, gamma mu A alpha G alpha A plus gamma mu A alpha G A alpha. Because if you took the, these to the left hand side, that will give you the expression of the covariant of the metric, which must match. In fact, these are the relations we use to solve for gamma in terms. Okay? So, we can now take these expressions and replace the first derivative of the metric with these. Okay? So, what do we get? So, we get. Um, uh, so, uh, what, uh, what do we get? Um, we get. Um, uh, This is minus half of uh, gamma mu a alpha g alpha a plus gamma mu alpha a g a alpha yes. times g a m times whatever we had here. Now this was simply this. Um, ah, sorry. So this was now gamma with the G A M was uh, gamma was that was gamma a mu b. Along the half. Oh, take one half. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is what the what the first step comes from the first step. That's also right, that's the first step. So from the second step, that's very easy. Just uh, minus b goes to me. Okay? So we get plus gamma nu a alpha g alpha a plus gamma nu alpha a g a alpha times gamma a mu b. Okay? And uh, uh, plus what we got from here, which was plus G A A gamma A mu alpha gamma alpha mu B minus G, G A A gamma A mu alpha gamma alpha mu. So this is a full set of first derivative terms. Okay. Now if I've done it right, um, these two should cancel against two of these. So let's look back and see what could do the cancel. So let's see. 
what does this have the property? This has the property that you lower an upper index of a gamma and that one that index is A. So this is like that and this is like that. So let's compare this term. You see here we take an upper index of a gamma and lower it to make A. And you contract away one of these lower indices and there's mu and mu. Here I take the upper index of a gamma, lower it to make A, contract away mu and mu. This term comes with a plus, this term comes with a minus. Okay? This clearly cancels with this. And then, of course, the mu goes to new also. This cancels with this. Okay? So, what are we left with? So, we're left with from the first set of two terms, we're left with. Okay, it's just 
mindless algebra with nothing to it. However, if you just said that you can check that, I don't know about you, but I somehow feel sometimes, I don't know, can I check it? It looks pretty complicated. I don't know how to forget that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, that, that's the purpose of doing the algebra. Not because I, well, I'm sure all of you would be able to do it yourselves, but I think we should do it in class anyway, basically for the purpose of demystification. Just to see that it's totally mindless. You know, any idiot can do it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, it's just totally straightforward. Everything that you want to do is totally straightforward. Okay. Um, also, so that you get some, some sense of how to do these index manipulations. So that when you have to do it yourself, you... Okay. So, we're going to, you know, bite, you know... We'll do a little more of this. We'll bite the bullet and just... You know, we're going to exercise ourselves. We'll strengthen our muscles by doing it. Uh, index manipulations, even though it's a little boring, just get that. Okay? We'll come to the more exciting stuff soon. Uh, just imagine though, doing all of this before you knew that it was correct. <laughs> hey, it's not totally non trivial. You know, you're totally in the dark. You've got this crazy idea that space time is dynamical. You know, every second day you're probably thinking, this is totally crazy, I must be a crackpot. Okay? <laughs> and then, then you have to do all this index manipulations and so on. It's totally remarkable that that happened. Okay. 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 Let, let's, um, let, let, let's go on. Okay. Now there is another important identity which the analogy with field strength suggests. Okay. And that analogy goes this way. As you know, field strengths obey um, a Bianchi time identity. Okay, this you're familiar with in the context of electron mechanics. Uh, in, in a U1 theory, you know that uh, um, that it's true that uh, d mu that if you take the cyclical sum of d alpha f mu nu and cyclically permute, you get zero. Why is that? It's because f mu nu, f mu nu is d, this is d alpha del mu a nu minus d alpha del mu a nu. And clearly the cyclical sum of this is the cyclical sum. The cyclical sum of this is. This is just, these two are symmetric. Just so the only question is which one goes here. Cyclically, you sum over all three possibilities. Yeah, there's very sum over all three possibilities. So, yeah. This is a famous thing that you know uh, in electromagnetism. And a similar identity is true in the study of non abelian gauge theory, when you replace the derivative with what's called the non abelian covariant derivative. Now, this is not a course of non abelian gauge theory, so we won't talk about what that is. Just to suggest that the analogy with this, uh, with, 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 um, uh, with the, with the non-abelian gauge theory suggests that a similar identity should be true uh, for uh, the curvature, but when you replace derivatives, of course, by covariant derivatives. Because it makes no sense to have an identity with ordinary derivatives. If it's true in one coordinate system, it won't be true in another. Okay? That's also what we do for gauge theory. In the non-abelian theory, we replace by covariant derivatives. So, this is the suggestion. This is the suggestion that comes up. So the suggestion is, let's check whether an identity of the form is it true that R, A, B, and now, you see, we should keep the first two indices fixed because they're like the matrix indices. Okay? And then do mu nu covariant derivative. Okay, this notation I have used so far in class, Landau Lipschitz uses and many texts used very often. Covariant derivative, ordinary derivative is denoted by comma. Covariant de derivative is denoted by semicolon. Okay? So is it true that this R A B uh, phi mu semicolon mu plus R A B phi okay, but we might as well do it lower. Why does it matter whether we do lower or uh, upper parentheses? Somebody? Because? 
Because I mean, if you're taking the, the you know, what is the difference between ordinarily? You see, the difference between these two expressions, upper and lower. Uh, the difference between these two expressions, upper and lower, is not trivial because there's a derivative. So g lower and g upper, you know, you have to differentiate after doing the lower and upper. But for the special case of lowering and upper, raising with the metric, it doesn't matter because covariant derivative of the metric is zero. So the met you can fearlessly raise and lower indices through derivatives through covariant derivatives because of this wonderful property. Yeah, but since we can do it as well for, um, you might as well do it. So, is this true? This is the question. Right? Okay. Now, to actually verify this in full detail, uh, is, you know, quite an algebraic exercise. But we're going to prove it using a trick. Okay? And the trick, which is a very useful trick, and we use repeatedly, we could also have used this trick to uh, check that the commutator of two covariant derivatives was the curvature, the thing we checked last time. But I didn't want to do it for the first exercise. Some of you can you do it honestly. Okay? And this, uh, uh, but now we should start that exercise using that trick. You might want to go to Okay, well, uh, here I'm going to use the trick. And the trick goes as follows. It says, well, look, this is a tensor equation. Okay? So, if it's true in one coordinate system, it's true in every coordinate system. Now, is there any specially nice coordinates? Yeah, the local Euclidean coordinates. As we have proved, we can always at a point move to a coordinate system where g is eta and the first derivatives of g vanish. Okay? So, um, uh, okay, so fine. So, I'm going to use that point. Now, actually, actually, it's probably more convenient for me to use the upper. Uh, sorry. After having been this big deal of lower and upper, it's going to be used as upper. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So let's, let's, let's remember what our expression for R A B is. R A B, mu nu. Now, once again, I'm going to write it down without looking at the answer. Just so that, you know, because it's useful to be able to do. And, uh, okay. So, remember what is this? It's del nu of gamma nu. And gamma nu was R gamma A B nu. Minus del mu of gamma nu. Del mu of gamma a b mu. Minus stuff. Minus gamma gamma nu. I'm not going to bother to write out the indices because I won't need that. Why would I need that? Because what I'm going to be doing is taking covariant derivatives in this special frame. Gamma vanish. Now gamma vanish doesn't mean derivatives of gamma vanish. But if you have a product of two gammas, when you take the derivative, one of them will always vanish. Okay? So we don't really need to want to look at look at these things. Is this clear? Because one of them we differentiate, that's not the derivative is not zero, but the derivative, the gamma multiply is Okay? Second thing, you can't build in this coordinate frame. Covariant derivatives and ordinary derivatives. This gamma vanishes. It's pretty convenient, right? Okay. So this expression in the special coordinate system, the expression that we had, simply becomes. So let's write it out. So simply becomes cyclically permute cyclic of del between phi mu and mu. Del phi del mu. Okay, how do I write this? D2 by D X, ah, I'll do commas. 
a b nu comma mu phi minus gamma a b mu mu phi cyclic in nu mu and phi obviously that because what do you do you permute between nu which of these three is the guy that's special that comes with b so there's one term with mu here one term with mu here one term with phi here Similarly, here. So one term with mu here, one term with mu here, phi here. They cancel. Okay? Obvious. One by fourth of that is. <laughs> Thank you. Let me do the rest of it. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Does it see any of that part? Yeah, I mean, top one is there. Is that has the second okay. part. Huh? What is this region? And this part is completely. Yeah, yeah, and this also completely. Okay, so then we can use this. Okay, so, um, so we have verified both this, um, uh, both the symmetric properties as well as this young Okay, the last little algebraic exercise I want to do not obvious is the part. If you remember in the last class, we defined a Ricci scalar. Uh, the definition of the Ricci scalar was take R A B mu nu. Contract first with curl same Okay. So first with third second. And we also define this Ricci tensor. Okay. Now, what I want to do is to take this Bianchi identity that we derived, and uh, from it conclude an interesting property uh, that relates derivatives of that Ricci scalar and the. Uh, uh, the okay. So let's rewrite this identity. So the identity was R A G mu nu phi plus R A B uh, phi nu mu plus R A B uh, phi mu nu is equal to zero. Now, in this identity, what I'm going to do is contract indices like this. A with mu, A with mu, and B with mu. Okay? Because of this lovely property of covariant derivatives commuting with the metric, you can fearlessly contract through derivatives. So this term gives us R nominated sign. I mean, R covariant derivative. Okay? What do we get from the other ones? So I'm writing A with mu, so and B with phi. This term gives minus R mu nu covariant derivative mu. 
because contraction of B with phi gives if you, you are supposed to contract either first with third or second with fourth to get a plus. If you contract second with third, you get a minus. No, but. Oh, no, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. Should I we should contract mu with mu. B with second, B with mu. Sorry. I should be contracting B with mu and. Uh, this will so this will start plus plus r uh, mu phi mu okay well over here so we have to contract a with mu
Can anyone see from chocolate box? I get chocolate. Dimensions 
of um, what are the dimensions of this um, square root gr term. So how do we do it? We will assign length dimensions to length and to time because c is equal to 1. Okay? Now d s squared is equal to metric times dx dx. All our coordinates will always have dimension in length. That tells you that the metric is dimensionless. So the only dimensions associated with the problem are in derivatives. Derivative carries one inverse length dimension, which is something that I will, following the quantum field theory language, refer to as a mass dimension. So you often say h bar equals 1, which is inverse length equals 1. Okay? That's just terminology. Inverse length dimension. Okay? Now, can somebody tell me what is the dimension of square root g? Zero. What's the dimension of One by L squared, exactly. One by L squared. Because it's two derivatives of the metric. It's either two derivatives of G or gamma times gamma. And each gamma is one derivative. Okay? Uh, so, one by L squared uh, is this derivative. Now, L squared is a dimension, this is going to be dimension, this what must the dimension of this be? One by L squared. Because this, this whole thing is like one by L squared. So k has to also be one. Right, so that cancels. So the s squared goes here cancels. Okay? So the dimension of this k, whatever it is, is equal to um, is uh, the, 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 the dimension of k and how do I no, no, I got it wrong. Sorry, I missed something else. There's D for it. Okay, the wrong answer. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So what's the dimension of K? Let's let's repeat that. L squared. Okay, because this is one by length squared, cancels two of the four length squares, yeah? There's length squared remaining, it has to be length squared. Okay. So in such an action here, there is a length scale associated with uh, there is a length scale associated with this new fundamental constant of data, which of course will, be, will soon be related to Newton's constant. Okay, now you see. Now let's suppose we make the following postulate: that there is a single length scale. There's a single interesting length scale associated with gravitational dynamics. Actually, this postulate will be false because of the cosmological constant. Yeah. But uh, let's uh, first make this postulate and see how far we can go. Okay? Suppose that every term in the action is weighted by the same length scale. Suppose this was the case. Then, What would we put here? What what would go behind this? What? So let's suppose I'm replacing I write k as equal to L p squared. L p is called the blank length. In the real world, it's ten to the power minus thirty three. Okay. Let me write this as L p squared. Suppose it is true as it 
turns out to be the case in the real world. The LP is a very small number. Okay? Suppose LP is a very small number. Then, for physics, at some length scale capital L, let's estimate the relative importance of all these terms of the action. Okay? For physics of length scale L, this term will work out to whatever its mass dimension is, its length dimension is, which was L squared. So this term will contribute like L squared by LP squared. This term will be scale invariant. And this term will be LP squared by L squared. If we're interested in looking at the motion of the sun around the earth, earth around the sun, <laughs> I'm regressing 500 years. <laughs> if we're interested in looking at the motion of the earth around the sun, L will be the earth sun distance. LP is some fixed number. Okay? Now, so the question is, the let us suppose that there is some unknown dynamics, some fundamental scale, that is generating all terms that are allowed by symmetry. Okay? Let's assume that every term that is allowed by symmetry is there in the action. For distances, okay? For dist at distances, long compared to LP, which is the most important term? It's the first Okay? Now, this sounds like a very simple argument. Sounds suspiciously simple, but you know, when you start doing quantum field theory, such arguments can be made quite precise. This is a bit suspicious because quantum field theory doesn't quite work for granted. But these arguments are made precise and formalized in what's called the Wilsonian renormalization proof. And the interesting thing is that these dimensional analysis kind of arguments often are very good guide to physics. Even when you take into account com complicated coupling. Okay? It's classically certain. I mean, it's, there's nothing to check. But if that's just true. But even quantum mechanically. Okay? Uh, so, what, 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 uh, what, uh, we concluded then is that, so, suppose your excellent question, the real answer to your excellent question, but why isn't such a term there? Is, uh, is probably as well. There's some as yet unknown theory, it's a fundamental landscape. Which is quantum mechanical. Okay? Which is, when you take that theory, whatever it is, and go down to low en energies compared to this Planck scale, okay? you get some effective action that has all possible terms allowed by symmetry. I mean, actually, the terms will be dictated by the dynamics of that theory, but in the absence of knowing what that theory is, we we'll expect all possible terms. Okay? Now, observationally, we see LP is an extremely small. For this reason, at length scale is large compared to LP. It's the first term that is of maximum dimensions. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the study of quantum field theory, this is the general law that terms of lowest mass dimension govern long distance physics. Okay. This sounds like a very beautiful story. It sounds like I'm very plausibly motivated that given that we have general coordinate invariance and so on, Einstein's action should be the right action. But there's a big gaping hole in this, in this argument. Can somebody point? If you take my logic to completion, there is one more term you can add to this action that is even more important at long distances. Which one? Root G. What's wrong with this term? Does it take a square root minus g? What power of LP will it come with? 1 by LP to the power 4. This is what you would expect. This is the most important. Okay? And, okay, so of course the term by itself is totally trivial. It's no guess. It's going to give you trivial equations of motion. I mean, inconsistent equations. Now, if you add this to this, what you can find is that the only solutions 
are universals which are curved on length scale planetary. So if you took the logic that I was outlining for you and took it to a completion, you would predict that we live in a universe whose curvature scale is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters, which unfortunately is totally wrong. <laughs> okay? This is one of the fundamental... Okay. Shorn of its sophist sophistry, this is one of... The question of why this prediction of gravity is totally wrong. Why this prediction? It's not prediction of gravity. It's prediction of being naive. What you're saying is, knowing nothing else, you predict that all terms allowed by symmetry are generated. And that's how it works pretty well. We get the second term. But somehow not the first term. Almost. Okay. So, uh, um, so, apparently what must be the case is that once we understand the correct theory of gravity, presumably the correct quantum theory of gravity, it will help us understand why this cosmological constant term is not generated, but is actually generated very small. Now, until the end of the 1990s, everyone had every, well, most theoretical physicists said as you, that since the cosmological constant is so small in blank units, clearly the fact that the universe is big, that the cosmological constant can't be, is approximately, is less than or equal to the inverse size of the universe. You know. So, what? That if such a term appears, it's not coming to suppress by 1 over LP to the 4, but 1 over Hubble scale. Size of the universe. There's a huge distance between 10 to the minus 3 and the size of the universe. So, since this, uh, uh, since there was this huge hierarchy, I think most theoretical physicists, certainly when I started my PhD, it was common law. Logical constant, zero. However, we've got observational evidence that this is probably not the case. Okay. So now there are two mysteries. First question is why is it zero? And the second question is why isn't it zero? <laughs> In the sense that it's nearly zero. Nobody had a good idea for why that was the case. But at least zero is a good number. You can imagine explaining zero. But now it's got even worse. How are you going to explain that it's not zero but enormously small? <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So this argument that I gave you, this, this, this nice beautiful dimensional analysis argument that sounds so nice, has this big gaping hole in it. And I would say this, this big gaping hole is one of the important... Um, it's the elephant in the room in theoretical physics. Uh, in fundamental theory. Because every, every way you have of trying to understand the gravitational theory from a fundamental point of view would predict that the universe was curved at a much smaller length scale than we see it. And that's obviously not true. Okay? So it's a startling, gaping fact that fundamental physicists have failed to account for for 50 years, 60 years. And you know, it's one of these, it's one of these things. Um, now, uh, you know, Planck was guided by, for instance, the failure of black body radiation. That's of course a little better because you can draw specific curves. It's, it's more data you have, the better it is. But this is one of these things. It's, it's an obvious contradiction between what we think we know how to predict and what we see, and uh, its resolution is awaited. Okay? So it's a very important question in theoretical physics. Now, uh, uh, since this is a course on general relativity, and since I don't know the answer to this cosmological constant question, and this cosmological constant question has given rise to a, very, a lot of very dispiriting talk. You know, some people try to explain it by saying, look, by what's called the anthropic principle, which says that, uh, look, if the universe was very, was very, very highly curved, then, you know, you wouldn't have galaxies, you wouldn't have matter, you wouldn't have people living inside planets to observe the universe. So, maybe somehow, for some reason or the other, the eternal inflation, there's a whole ensemble of universes, most of which are very highly curved. Once in a while you come about with a universe 
it's a big curvature. And the question is why? Why are we so incredibly lucky as to live in that one? Is that because we couldn't have lived in any other? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, uh, this, this may be in the certain uh, sophistry to this. Yes, it's, it's, it's a cute argument, but I don't think it's fixed. You know, uh, once you start getting into these kind of discussions, you're going very near to kind of things. You know, philosophy. <laughs> And that has led us nowhere. You know, what we want is something with equations which we can predict with, which we can make progress with. And if this is the best we can do, I would say we're saying we're giving up. Okay. Uh, people have only been led to such despiriting arguments because they haven't been able to think of anything better. Okay? Uh, I think that's true. And it's your job. You know, you are the fresh new generation. You guys have to come up with some the right crazy idea that will help us understand why this is. What, what, this big, I don't know, how to explain this elephant in the room. Okay, but having said all of this, we are going to sweep it under the carpet. We are going to um, assume that for some reason, this argument which does not work in predicting that a big first term, works in giving you a second term and all other terms being highly surprised. That has an ex extremely good confirmation for me. Okay, so at least from experiment we know that it's true that at reasonable length scales, the term that governs interactions is the square of GR. And had it not been for this elephant in the room, there would have been a very reasonable argument for it. Okay, we should take a whole argument with many pinches of salt because of the elephant. But let's move on. Okay, so this is Einstein's action. This is the action he wrote down without this one. And we're going to, in the rest of this course, we're going to study. We're going to study this. Okay. Now, um, the thing that we want to do is understand this action a little bit. So now there are two parts to this action. Uh, what, what we're going to do is, of course, we're going to take this action and get equal with motion by varying this action with respect to the Yes. 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 Uh, now, you know, if you just try to keep all possible terms, you lose, more or less lose predictability. So basically what this is telling you is that once you get to length scale small compared to, uh, of order of the length scale, then you know you need the correct quantum theory of error. That tells you what the right action is. This crude symmetry analysis is not good enough. You need to know what the right theory is. Okay? Uh, yeah, so... Once we start trying to understand the big bang or something like that, we need that. That's a great motivation to understand what we Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that, of course. I don't know how to answer this. Okay? But these are great questions. Excellent. So, uh, uh, let's move on. We're going to take this action and vary it with respect to the metric to get, uh, uh, to get uh, the Einstein equation of motion. Now, In varying it, there are two parts. There's a variation of minus square root gr, and then there's a vari variation of square root g in the matter energy. Both terms are important. Okay? We need to start by studying the variation of square root g in the matter energy. Let me take an example. Let me take the Maxwell uh, the Maxwell Lagrangian that we Okay? So, uh, minus 1 by 4, for instance, f mu nu, f mu nu, which is equal, which I'll write more explicitly as minus 1 by 4, square root minus g, f 
alfa beta f mu nu g alfa beta g mu Okay, let me take this Lagrangian and vary it with respect to the metric field. And let me choose the metric with upper components as my basic field. Yes, thanks. Thank you. This would have been a trivial action for me to see. Minor is related to some 
another object of the uh, of a matrix. It's inverse. G inverse is equal to M, or maybe M transpose, M transpose, uh, no, no. or just M, right? divided by G. And how do you know that? You know that because if you now multiply by G on this, when you take the sum, you know, you get rho times minor to give you the determinant is of giving you delta. Okay? So this is a familiar formula from your study of matrices. So we can rewrite this at least for some I would have to think through the transpose part, but we don't care because we're dealing with symmetric matrices, transpose itself. We can rewrite this in this case as G alpha beta because that's the inverse of G. And with delta G alpha. Okay? Times G. Okay? So this is a nice formula for uh, for variation of for, for the determinant. Now, we're interested in varying this determinant. We're interested in varying this determinant. Um, uh, we're interested in bearing this determinant with respect to the upper G's. Can you tell me what the right formula would be? Delta G is equal to G alpha, uh, delta 
minus G alpha, beta, um, G alpha, beta, G. What we want is delta of square root of minus G. OK? So delta of square root of minus G is equal to minus half by square root of minus g times delta g. Which is equal to minus half times minus delta g alpha beta g alpha beta into g by square root of minus g. Now I'll take this minus in here and write this as minus half into uh, delta g alpha beta times g alpha beta square root of minus Okay? So let's put everything together. This is by definition going to be called half times square root minus g times t alpha beta delta g alpha. Okay? So whatever you get by varying the matter part of the action with respect to electric field, it'll always take this form. This is necessarily true from projectile ball. Square root g times the tensor times delta g alpha beta. That tensor, whatever it is, you're going to we're going to define as the stress energy tensor of the model. Okay. So for the electromagnetic field, we've concluded that 
d alpha beta is equal to minus 1 by 4 uh, f alpha uh, theta f beta theta minus half g alpha beta This is not just an example. Okay. In general, whatever you get by varying the matter field, we're going to call the stress engine. Okay. Now, there is a very important property of the stress energy tensor okay, that I will now try to prove. This stress energy tensor is basically, up to one subtlety, the same thing as the Gotha card for space-time transitions. And because of that, you know, the basic property of a Noether current is that it gives rise to conserved, I mean, that the, there's conserved current associated. Okay? And so what I'm going to prove to you is that this trace energy tensor that comes from an arbitrary matter field, matter field is conserved. Obeys a conservation type. Okay? And the proof is very simple. We left the class for this. Um, it's very simple. It requires almost no algebra to show. I think. x mu is equal to x mu plus zeta mu. 
See, part of the reason we have to unlink our problem sets together is that your teaching assistant seems to have vanished. <laughs> <laughs> What? What? Somebody seen them? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, suppose we've got uh, a quantum change of this form. So x q is equal. Okay? Then, up to a sign that I can't remember, that really gets straight when we give you a problem set. Delta g mu, which is g prime minus g, is equal to del mu of zeta mu minus del mu of zeta mu. But then it's covariant. This is not obvious from what I've told you. But it's true, and you prove this. Okay? So, now what do we find? You see, what we had was that by definition, the variation of this action with respect to G, G alpha, for arbitrary variation with respect to G alpha beta, was half square root minus G, T alpha beta, delta G alpha beta. This is always true. But we've concluded from our logic that the variation with respect, with respect to those changes of the metric that come from a coordinate transformation must vanish on solution frequency. Okay. So, we conclude that it must be that uh, half square root minus g of t alpha beta uh, del alpha strongest zeta beta plus del a. Symmetry and the del beta zeta alpha is equal to zero. Now, this is symmetry. So these two terms are the same thing. So, this, so that implies that minus square root minus g t alpha beta del alpha zeta beta is equal to zero. For arbitrary zeta. Now we just use this thing to do something with this TR. So first thing we do is use the chain. We write this as uh, square root minus g del alpha of t alpha beta zeta beta might as well be the alpha alpha now we get and up minus square root minus g of uh, del alpha t alpha beta beta zeta beta is equal to zero because the covariant delta to a basic chain rule. Okay? And now this thing has a vector in it. And do you remember we had this nice formula for the divergence of um, uh, of a vector? The covariant we had covariant divergence del alpha of zeta any any vector. Is it 1 by square root minus g del alpha uh, square root minus g theta alpha? We derive this in one of our units. Let's use that formula. So this term, that makes that term, the 1 by square root g cancels the square root g. So it becomes del alpha of square root minus g T alpha beta zeta beta. And therefore, this is a total net. Okay? So if we focus on 
zeta is, you know, we take some action, we've got some boundary term, we look at zeta as the vanish of the boundary. The coordinate transformation completely dies. We look at such coordinate transformations, the vanish of the boundary. A non zero away from a certain region, uh, only in a certain region, this term vanishes. I want to emphasize that that's something very important here. In order to use Gauss's Gauss is not making this a surface integral, we have to write this as an ordinary derivative. Gauss's law works for ordinary derivatives. It's just a statement, it's a trivial statement of integration. It doesn't work for covariant derivatives. Right? In this case, this covariant derivative was converted into an ordinary derivative nicely cancelling the square root g factor. Otherwise, we couldn't make this up. Okay? Once we have that now, everything's simple. See, this thing vanishes. So, what we conclude is that this term is zero. But this is zero for arbitrary zeta beta, therefore it must be. That del alpha of t alpha beta. So the stress, the matter stress tensor defined through this definition as the variation of the matter part of the action with respect to the upper part of the metric as a property that it is necessarily automatically conserved. Is this clear? Okay? So, when we find Einstein's action, we will find some equation of the sort, some tensor alpha beta that comes from varying the Einstein part of the action, is equal to the alpha beta. That's clear. But this the alpha beta is not something arbitrary, it's automatically conserved. Now, can you use that to guess what this is going to be? Right? Well, look on this part of the board. This term. You see, if you've got an equation, if that's true, it must be true that we take derivatives on both sides to remain true. Okay? This thing has a property that its covariant derivative is zero. Okay? So the better thing is that whatever you get on the left hand side is some constant like that. Now, Einstein, by trying to run down general relativity, made many false attempts. And one of his prominent false attempts was to make run down the equation r alpha beta is equal to t alpha. Okay? Einstein was not thinking, he was just writing down equations of motion, not, not thinking about its own reaction. Okay. So, he just wrote down this equation. And uh, it took him some time to realize that it was obviously wrong because it was inconsistent. Derivative on both sides. So, now, at the same time that Einstein was working, you know, these guys, Hilbert and uh, a few other people, uh, were, were uh, uh, you know, were deeply investigating the geometry of arbitrary curved spaces. And Hilbert and friends knew the stuff very well. They knew of the right combination of curvature that that um, vanished under covariant derivative. Uh, they'd written down, it down before. So the action that's the Einstein's action is often called the Einstein Hilbert action. For various reasons. Hilbert himself though was very modest about his contributions to general relativity, but when asked about whether he thought he'd done the important stuff, he said something like, well, any child in Grottingham knew the combination of curvatures that <laughs> was vanished at the covariant element. That wasn't the important thing. The real story was about that man in the elevator. <laughs> okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so, we'll, uh, in the next class, we will actually derive the Einstein part of the, or the Einstein Hilbert part of the Einstein action by varying square root gr. Then we will have Einstein's equations in our hand. Then we'll be ready to fly. Okay, fine. Sorry if I made you wait for you. Next up tomorrow is the usual time.